Alright. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, well, it's a, it's a great privilege um, for me to give this uh, lecture in honor of Cesare Emiliani, the, like, the parent of paleo, one of the parents of paleoceanography. Um, today I'm going to primarily focus on something that has been getting a lot of attention over the last decade or so, and that's the uh, role of the tropics in determining uh, the Pliocene warmth and also in uh, northern hemisphere glaciation. And I hope to show you by the end of this talk that the Pliocene, which is a warm period, the Pliocene warm period between four and a half and three million years ago, um, can be used to study climate processes that are relevant and related to long-term global warming. Uh, before I uh, forget and before I get started, I want to uh, acknowledge a number of people. First, my um, my uh, great graduate students, past and present, um, and the ones that listed, are listed here, I'm going to be highlighting the data that they generated, and I will be talking about ideas that we formulated together. So I want to give those graduate students a lot of credit. Next, I also want to acknowledge my UCSC colleagues who um, were really uh, instrumental in helping uh, with the, de the generation of the data that, is going to be, that I'm going to be showing today. And I want to acknowledge um, a list of colleagues that uh, provided some uh, unpublished data for me to show in this talk. And these people, along with the others listed um, here, I'm going to have to use the mouse, I think, to point things out. Um, these people <coughs> here have really influenced and shaped many of the ideas that I'm going to be presenting today. So I just want to acknowledge um, them. <coughs> Okay, this figure is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which shows global warming predictions made by an ensemble of models. And different colors are uh, different emission scenarios. Uh, the orange shows predictions um, of global warming into uh, the um, next 100 years um, if you hold CO2 uh, concentrations at the level that they were in 1990. The blue shows global warming predictions if you hold uh, CO2 uh, level after 2100 at 550 ppm, and the green shows global warming predictions if you were to hold uh, CO2 levels at um, 700 ppm after 2100. The model spread that you see here represents the fact that different models produce different global uh, temperature responses to the same CO2 forcing. And that's because each model represents, of course, different climate feedbacks slightly differently, and the sensitivity of temperature to CO2 is different depending on the model. Model-to-model -model differences are also apparent and, and greater than this if you were to look at regional uh, temperature and precipitation patterns. Now, how is Earth history and paleoclimatology relevant to this? Well, um, Earth history contains examples of alternate climates when CO2 was higher than today and when temperatures were higher to the day, to, than today. Um, that's not to say that there are really any examples in Earth history that are really one-to-one -one analogs that you can really directly use to predict uh, future uh, global warming. But one thing that paleoclimate studies can do is that they can be um, used to, um, to test climate theories and models to better understand the feedbacks that go into the models and to constrain regional and global climate sensitivity in order to improve the models that predict future climate. And I want to try to demonstrate that to you today with the Pliocene. So um, it turns out that state-of-the-art climate models have really not been able to hindcast certain really important features of the Pliocene warm period between four and a half and three million years ago. And that provides uh, concrete examples of how models can be improved. Okay, the top graph here on the, the top uh, graph on the left is, a fam is probably familiar to anyone that um, is familiar with paleoclimatology. This is a, a graph over the last 650,000 years um, that shows climate change at, in the Antarctic ice cores. Uh, PCO2 is in red and uh, temperature is in light blue. The red bar that you see right on the zero mark, uh, zero age mark, 
uh, if I can use this to point. So there's the, that's the last 650,000 years on the horizontal axis. This red bar here um, basically represents the, uh, the uh, amplitude of uh, CO2 increase that's occurred um, due to anthropogenic or human emissions. And you can see that it far exceeds anything that the Earth has experienced over the last 650,000 years. The other graphs are benthic oxygen isotope records, which are proxy records for ice volume and, and climate over the last 3 million years in the middle and the last 65 million years at the bottom. And here you can see that ice age climate over the last few million years, let's say, oh, I'm trying to get this. These right here are the ice ages, the most recent ice ages. But you really have to go back into this Pliocene warm period in here prior to 3 million years ago to find global temperatures that were warmer than today for a sustained period of time and CO2 levels that were higher than pre-anthrogenic values. And the majority, in fact, of Earth history over the last 65 million years was warmer than today, and this provides us tremendous opportunities to study processes that, um, that are responsible for global warmth. As, as PCO2 in the atmosphere rises, the study of a larger dynamic range of warm climate states in the past in Earth's history becomes even more important. Okay, one person who certainly understood and appreciated how you could use paleoclimate studies for understanding fundamental Earth system processes was um, Cesare Maliani. And um, as, uh, as Phil has mentioned, he had large bodies of work in several different fields, and his um, contributions to a number of different fields cannot be overstated. One thing that some people might not know is that Emiliani also recognized the need to drill into, into ocean sediments to get pre-Ice Age uh, samples. And he was responsible, actually, for drilling the first long section that reached Pliocene sediments off of Jamaica in 1963. Uh, soon afterwards, Emiliani, with many others, uh, uh, started a consortium of institution, Joides, which organized the deep sea drilling project. And the ocean drilling program was born out of that, an international program, and then the integrated ocean drilling program. Uh, the current phase of the ocean drilling program ends in 2013, and planning for the next phase has begun. So I'm just going to switch hats for one minute and, uh, <clears throat> and encourage you um, to, just like Emiliani did in his early career, um, contribute as part of the science community to set the scientific agenda for the next um, phase of the integrated ocean drilling program. And there's two community meetings, one for the U.S., that's a web-based meeting that will happen in February of 2009, another one in September of 2009 next year, a big international meeting in Bremen, um, where there's gonna, the community is going to get together and set priorities for the, ocean drilling, the integrated ocean drilling program beyond 2013. Okay, this is the roadmap sort of for the rest of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to start showing some uh, Pliocene data. The first I'm going to show is PCO2 measurements from the Pliocene and also temperature data to try to get a handle on uh, what the Pliocene might tell us about global climate sensitivity or the response of the system to CO2 forcing. And then I'll go on and talk about tropical, um, the tropical system and, um, and some really amazing and peculiar things that are going on in the tropics in the Pliocene and then how that might relate to high latitudes. All right, this is, uh, just to orient you, this is the global ice volume curve, again, for the last five million years. And many of the plots that I'm going to be showing you from now on are oriented in this way, with the horizontal axis going from zero to five million, five or six million. And um, <clears throat> this shows the, the uh, steady increase in global ice volume. Over, that, over the last five million years. Here's a record of uh, sea surface temperature that will be uh, presented in a paper uh, tomorrow if you want to get more details on it. This is a sea surface temperature record from the North Atlantic um, generated by Kira Lawrence, and, and it shows here also the cooling of the um, North Atlantic that happened um, in concert with the ice volume increase. Probably one of the most recognizable uh, records of northern hemisphere glaciation is the ice rafted debris records. And these are um, ice rafted debris records, one from the North Atlantic and one from the North Pacific, that shows a big increase in ice rafted debris delivered into the open ocean at about 2.7 million years ago. And this represents when the ice sheets, so there was cooling that happened, and then the ice sheets grew to the point where icebergs calved uh, 
Uh, they crabbed into the ocean and icebergs delivered this ice raft of debris out into the open uh, Pacific and Atlantic. Um, so this is the kind of the background history or what we, what, we, um, uh, what we think about when we look at the last five million years, the Pliocene warm period going between about three and four and a half million years ago, and then that leading into the Pleistocene ice ages. All right, what did CO2 look like over this time period as climate was cooling? Now, there's not a lot of good records on paleo PCO2, and these are some preliminary data that have some fairly large errors on them as yet because we have to constrain them better. Um, but that shows a steady uh, decrease in PCO2 over this time period. Uh, there's also some published work um, from data around 3 million years ago that puts the PCO2 at around 400, 350 to 400 ppm. Uh, and there's some, some uh, disagreement between um, these, these different types of data sets that has to be reconciled. But in general, it's thought that the, we're thinking that the Pliocene had about 100 ppm higher than pre-anthropogenic values, which is very similar to the actual atmospheric CO2 values that we have today. Um, I want to point out also a poster um, that I saw that has, um, that marks, uh, that, that uh, says that there's about 300 and four to 400 ppm. So this is a poster that's going to be on Thursday. Um, so there's um, uh, some evidence that CO2 in the Pliocene was higher than today, exactly how much higher, probably somewhere between 300 and 350 and 400 ppm. All right, this is... Um, uh, 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 graph that shows the predicted equilibrium temperature for um, any uh, given uh, PCO2 concentration. I'm sorry, anomaly. So a temperature or warming of the of the global Earth for every for any given PCO2 concentration. And this depends on the climate sensitivity. So, for instance, the two degree curve tells uh, would would assume that for a doubling of CO2 you get two degrees of global temperature rise. The four degree curve tells you that for a doubling of CO2 you get about a four degree temperature rise. And if we use these um, predictions of uh, of climate sensitivity, and we try to predict what the Pliocene uh, temperature um, should have been. And we know that uh, temp the PCO2 was something between 350 and 400 ppm. That translates, depending on which climate sensitivity you want to use, between about one or two degrees of global temperature rise or de temperature um, anomaly or uh, global temperature higher in the pl Pliocene compared to today. Now, the actual temperature in the Pliocene was more like two or three degrees warmer than today. So that implies a climate sensitivity that's in the, on the high end of these estimates somewhere between four and nine degrees of temperature rise um, for a doubling of CO2, depending on um, which uh, CO2 estimate you use and exactly which global temperature estimate you use. But for that range, it gives you something like four to nine degrees. So what the Pliocene represents is a time period of global warmth that is, um, is, is higher and is more warm than we would expect from the CO2 levels, the very moderate CO2 levels that it had. And there's a lot of different reasons that could be. It could be that we don't understand climate sensitivity very well. It could be that um, the long-term climate of the Pliocene is not well represented by these um, measures of climate sensitivity, that once the ice sheets and, and the ocean circulation, deep ocean circulation, and other um, other um, components of the Earth system that have a long um, lag time, once they equilibrate, that you actually that they actually get you actually enhance global warming. It's not really clear, but that obviously means that it's incredibly important to understand why the Earth was actually warmer three million years ago, given the fact that the CO2 was not that high. And um, what processes determine Plio Pliocene climate is an important question. Do models do a good job of including these processes? Are, we, are these processes that happen in the warm period well represented in models that predict future climate? And then um, what caused northern hemisphere glaciation is an interesting question also to pose that will help, um, under, help you understand um, how the transition happened and what the factors are that drive the, um, the Pliocene warm period and the transition. All right, this uh, map here on the top is, is uh, a uh, map of the uh, global warming ex predicted um, by 2100 with emission scenario B1, which includes a buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere reaching a level of about 550 ppm by 2100. 
And the bottom is a observed sea, tempa sea surface temperature field. This is observed, not modeled, for the mid-Pliocene warm period. And there are really two really noticeable differences between these two. One, as pointed out previously, the Pliocene is even warmer than you would, what you would predict um, from, um, compared to the future, um, despite the fact that CO2 levels in the Pliocene were, were well below 550 ppm. But the second and feature, which is, I think is really intriguing, is that there's, in, the, in the Pliocene, there was more warming at high latitudes and very little warming in the big, uh, uh, in, the, in sort of the Indo-Pacific warm pool when the, in the low latitudes. And that's really different than a, what we think of as a typical global warming scenario or global warming prediction from greenhouse gases. So um, this important, these important features um, of, the, of the Pliocene are, are not really very accurately modeled by um, models that attempt to simulate Pliocene climate, and um, which makes the studies of tropical climate change in the Pliocene kind of all that more compelling when you can get um, data not matching models. It points to um, some uh, interesting things that need to be studied. All right, so what I'm going to be doing now is showing you what some of that data is in the low latitudes in more detail. Um, and, um, and then trying to maybe explain it, but uh, first I'm going to show you uh, a bunch of uh, uh, data. I want to give you a little, I want to just uh, give a little background first. For the tropical Pacific, um, one of the most notable state, uh, features of the tropical Pacific, if you look at the mean state, the normal state of the tropical Pacific today, is that there is a strong temperature gradient across the Pacific. Um, from the warm western pool to the eastern equatorial Pacific where the temperatures are colder because there's upwelling of cold water. And the upwelling of uh, the thermocline there is fairly deep, I mean fairly shallow, so uh, water that's entrained um, by the winds during upwelling brings cold water to the surface. Now there's short-lived deviations from normal are, um, for instance, El Nino, and during an El Nino event, um, the symmetry, of, uh, the asymmetry of sea surface temperatures across the Pacific is much reduced, and you get more symmetric temperature pattern across the Pacific. And what I'm going to be, um, a question that I'm going to pose uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm not going to answer, but for the Pliocene, um, I, can, I can try to answer it, is from the point of view of Earth's history, which was mostly warm until the last couple of million years, um, could this be the normal mean state so that our, um, the, the average state of the tropical Pacific could have, possibly, could have possibly been quite different than it is today. Now, if we look at um, a, little, a few other things that are involved in that temperature gradient, here's the temperature gradient here in the normal state from warm to cold in the East Equatorial Pacific. The other thing that's asymmetric in the tropical Pacific is the thermocline, which is deep in the west and it's shallow in the east. And these things go hand in hand. That upwelling of cold water occurs in the east because the thermocline is shallow. There's a strong temperature gradient across the Pacific, which drives, enhances the, the easterly trade winds. There's a lot of others, uh, deep convection and air rising in the west, and you get this very strong walker circulation. So besides the, the asymmetry of temperatures across the Pacific, there's also very strong atmospheric walker circulation. During an El Nino, all of this symmetry breaks, this, this asymmetry breaks down, and you get more symmetric temperature across the Pacific, a more symmetric thermocline depth across the Pacific, and you have a breakdown of the Walker circulation. All right, this sea surface temperature record from the East Equatorial Pacific illustrates El Nino interannual variability. Um, Federoff and Philander pointed out that the changes in the background state can occur that are caused by processes completely independent from El Nino. So there are changes in the mean state that may happen that may not be relevant or not have any um, implications on, um, on El Nino itself, El Nino variability. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about is a permanent El Nino-like state for the Pliocene, and I'm really going to be talking about a change in the mean state. I'm not suggesting anything about El Nino. There, is no good, there are no good records of El Nino variability for the Pliocene yet. Um, and I'm going to call this El Padre. And El Padre is um, a term of convenience um, that highlights that the processes responsible for this, this, uh, this mean state are, are distinctly different from those responsible for El Nino. Okay, so I'm going to call it uh, the permanent El Nino-like state, which 
which confuses some people. I'm going to just call, I'm going to call it El Padre from now on. Okay, the, the proxies that we use to reconstruct uh, tropical conditions um, that I'm going to be showing you are the alkenone saturation index, um, which uh, varies as a function of calcification temperature. And these are these long chain, chain organic molecules that, um, that are measured and quantified in the fine fraction, organic fraction of the sediment. These, um, these biomarkers are um, synthesized by a couple of species of coccolithophores. And it turns out that the uh, ratio of, the, of the, uh, the molecule that has, a double bond, has two double bonds relative to the total um, is a function of temperature and is, is well calibrated. The other um, paleo temperature proxy I'm going to use is the magnesium calcium value of foraminiferous shells. And this is a completely different uh, concept here. This is measured in uh, calcite of, of foram shells, foraminiferous shells. And uh, magnesium substitutes for calcium as a function of temperature. And so I'm going to be using this relationship in a couple of different species of planktonic foraminifera to, um, to reconstruct temperatures in the past. So two different proxies. This is the, in the, these are in foraminiferous shells in the coarse fraction of the sediment. The other is fine fraction organic material. Um, cre uh, produced by a completely different organism. All right, this is data that um, was published um, a while ago in 2005, and it shows magnesium calcium records from the west and the eastern, western and the eastern tropical Pacific. Uh, the western tropical uh, Pacific shows some ups and downs, but not a lot of temperature changes in the Pliocene relative to today. In the east, you can see this asymmetry in the temperature across the basin um, that exists today. But as you go back in time, what you see is that the asymmetry really decreases and that there's a, that there's a much smaller temperature difference between the two sides of the basin um, in the Pliocene warm period before you go into the big uh, northern hemisphere glaciations on ice ages. If you look at alkenones from the same site in the, in the east, you get essentially the same story. There's a little bit of offset in the uh, absolute temperatures, but the pattern is the same. It really looks like in that location that temperatures were quite a bit warmer uh, in the cold, in the east equatorial cold tongue uh, relative to the western, um, the western warm pool. Now, since this work uh, has been done, there's been a number of other studies that have been done. This is the same data from 847 both the magnesium calcium and the alkenone data is shown here. Uh, this is a, a record um, from 846, a Milankovitch resolving record that also shows the same thing. Um, it's a little bit offset. It's in a location with colder water today. Um, but you also see that temperatures were warmer in the Pliocene and then cooled. This is a new record that uh, we just generated this year, this one alkyon, and there's also magnesium calcium data in there um, from 848, which is a little bit outside of the cold tongue that also shows that it was warmer in the Pliocene and then cooled. And there's also some data from 1241, which is just at the northern edge of the cold tongue that shows temperatures were warmer in that location than today as well. So there's a, really a lot of data that supports the idea that the cold tongue that today is pretty cold was quite a bit warmer by several degrees in the Pliocene warm period. And if you put the average values for the Pliocene warm period relative to today, this is the anomaly relative day. It was three and a half to say one, one and a half to three and a half degrees cool, uh, warmer in the Pliocene compared to today, depending on where you are in the cold tongue. Whereas in the West, it didn't look, it wasn't, it wasn't warmer. Uh, to help verify the temperatures of the Indo-Pacific warm pool. Um, uh, Petra Deakins measured the um, magnesium, magnesium calcium record there that she's going to be presenting in a, in a paper on, uh, on Thursday. So I'm not going to show you the record here. I'm just going to show you the average data for the Pliocene warm period was not warmer again than it is today. So that sort of verifies the idea that the Indo-Pacific warm pool was a pretty constant temperature. And there's other data as well from planktonic foraminifera, um, for example, that show the same result. If you put all of these records together, and these are just the, the generally the smooth records. We have two records now from the west, and then there's all these records from the east that show very nicely the uh, more, more sort of asymmetric sea surface temperature pattern of the Pleistocene, and which, which we infer as, as representing strong walker circulation, and then a more symmetric 
pattern, a smaller sea surface temperature gradient across the Pacific, which we infer represents a weak walker circulation. Okay, so what if you go outside the tropics a little bit? I'm going to show you some data from a number of different sites now from the um, subtropical regions, uh, from upwelling regions as well as from the gyre. So these are four records. The bottom one is the Peru-Chile margin at 16 degrees south in the in an upwelling area, and that also shows that temperatures were warmer in this upwelling region, just like it was in the East Equatorial Pacific. The California, two California margin sites also show that it was warmer in coastal California by a lot, by seven to eight degrees in the Pliocene. And, the, and even in the gyre, it was a little bit warmer um, in, the, well, in the Pliocene um, warm period compared to today. And the estimates there, this is the average um, uh, Pliocene temperature relative to today's temperature. It was about uh, seven or eight degrees warmer in the coastal upwelling regions and a few degrees warmer in the gyre. Okay, so if you plot all of these anomalies on this map, it's starting, this is what it's start, you're starting to fill this map out a little bit. One thing I want you to notice is that just like in the tropical regions, the zonal temperature gradient in the Pliocene was reduced because it, war it warmed more in the east than the west. In the high latitudes, that was also true, that it warmed more in the east than it did in the west. So the zonal temperature gradients in the mid-latitudes were also reduced. Now, because it warmed a little bit in the subtropical regions, but not in the tropical warm pool, then the, actually the meridional temperature gradient was also reduced in the Pliocene. So you have an expanded warm pool and reduced zonal and meridional temperature gradients in the Pliocene. Kind of more uniform temperatures. Now, if you go to this, there's this record from the Manguela Current from the West African margin, and it shows an incredible resemblance to the California margin record. Um, so the fact that the upwelling regions in the Pacific um, were warmer um, is, is a story that's not perhaps uh, isolated to the Pacific, but it could be that in the Atlantic as well that um, the Pliocene was quite different in upwelling regions being quite a bit warmer in those regions in, in the Atlantic as well. So in, that record is here. It was nine degrees warmer in the early Pliocene warm period compared to today. And here's a few more data points um, that I've added um, some uh, uh, new data from um, Kira Lawrence in the Equatorial Atlantic um, that shows this, this area that has moderate upwelling was a little bit warmer. And then the uh, northwest um, uh, African margin also, uh, upwelling area was also warmer. Okay, so in, in, in summary, when you look at these temperature patterns, what you see is that today's cold upwelling regions were warm in the Pliocene, early Pliocene, and there was reduced meridional and zonal temperature gradients in the Pliocene. All right, now, how could this happen? I mean, what, um, what, what could actually lead to uh, warmer upwelling regions, perhaps globally? Um, well, we started to think about how the subtropical and tropical regions might be linked, and there's a number of different ways. I mean, for one, it could be, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is winds. That maybe the winds were reduced in the Pliocene warm period everywhere, and, or at least in upwelling areas, and that the temperatures were warmer in those areas because the winds were, re were, were relaxed or, or, or not as strong. Uh, so that's definitely a possibility. The problem with that idea is that um, the biological productivity in these upwelling areas was still very high. And you would expect that if it was simply a matter of wind strength, that there would be some correspondence, some close correspondence between, you know, warm sea surface temperature and low biological productivity ramping up to high biological productivity with low temperatures, but in, ter but in fact, they're, they're, they're fairly decoupled from each other. So that means that even in the Pliocene warm period when there was warm, warm water in these upwelling regions, it, there was probably still upwelling, and except that the water that was being upwelled was warm but nutrient-rich so, so that you could still have high biological um, production. So that points, to a, 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 that points to the possibility that there must have been changes in the character of the subsurface water that upwelled. And so if we look at oceanic linkages between these regions, there are ways in which the subtropical and tropical regions are linked through the upper ocean circulation, where you have subduction 
of thermocline waters in mid-latitudes that then um, flow to low latitudes and eventually upwell. And there's a way to link um, upwelling areas um, um, th uh, throughout the uh, subtropical and tropical regions if you can change the character of the thermocline waters. That's the, uh, the waters just below the mixed layer that upwell. So um, to, uh, to look at this idea, we've done some thermocline depth reconstructions. And in, the, uh, in a normal year, uh, there's this species that we use called Globertalia tumida that grows in the subsurface at about 100 meters. And in a normal year, in a normal, a normal year today, it would grow in recorded temperature of about 15 degrees Celsius, whereas during an El Nino year, when the thermocline is deeper, it would be bathed in warmer water and we record a temperature more around 20 degrees Celsius. So it's, a, it's potentially a, a bug that's really, um, that could be quite sensitive to shifts in the mean state of the thermocline depth. So this is um, the record from, uh, so we measured uh, magnesium calcium records of G2 meta in four different, uh, three different sites and then there's another site that was measured by, um, um, by some colleagues. And I'm going to show you the, the, the subsurface temperature records from these, uh, these four sites. Here's 847 in the East Equatorial Pacific, and you can see that the 1241 record lies right on top of that. And so what that shows is much warmer subsurface temperatures in the Pliocene warm period. It was something like 20, 18, 20 degrees in the subsurface there at 100 meters. And our interpretation of the cooling of the subsurface waters is perhaps that the thermocline will either cooled or, sh or shoaled where um, as, the, as, it, as it shoaled, um, you can imagine that this species um, was bathed with colder water and recorded colder water as, uh, with time. Now, in the western uh, Pacific and the, and the, east, and the Indian Ocean, um, there are two the two records there are, resemble each other quite closely, and they show, again, uh, this cooling trend through the um, last five million years, also indicating that the thermocline shoaled through this time period in, in agreement with what we find in the east. Uh, it's not surprising that there's an offset between them because right now you have, um, you know, you have a, a, a much a deeper thermocline in the west than you do in the east. But what's interesting is that they all record this general um, shoaling or cooling of the thermocline. If you look at the uh, actual time periods, so let's just take a look at five million years. This little schematic shows, uh, if you can imagine, this is the upper ocean, you know, the upper few hundred meters of the ocean going from the west to the east. Uh, the, the dotted line might be the bottom of the Ekman layer where winds can bring and train water and bring them up to the surface. And if the thermocline was deep, let's say at five million years ago, it was almost the same temperature both in the east and the west. Um, that must have been deep, uh, the sea surface temperatures were warm. If there was upwelling, it was probably not, and uh, the thermocline was sufficiently deep and the cool water was sufficiently deep that you couldn't bring that water, cold water, up to the surface um, with upwelling. Now, right after that, around four million, there's this big uh, cooling that happens in the, um, in the east. Uh, but not in the West, between five and four million years ago, so that might indicate that the tilt of the thermocline developed at that time, and that's why it's, it's, uh, the subsurface temperatures are cooler in the East than the West. And then through the next millions of years, it looks like there was a generally a shoaling of the thermocline, and perhaps to a point where um, the thermocline crossed some threshold where, uh, where uh, the winds could then take the colder temperatures within or below the thermocline and bring them to the surface and cool the East Equatorial Pacific. So the evolution of the thermocline could have happened in concert with the temperature, uh, the establishment of the asymmetric temperature pattern across uh, the Pacific. If you see all this data together, here is the weaker walker circulation in the early Pliocene when the thermocline was either warmer or deeper. In the Pleistocene, when there was a strong walker circulation, um, the thermocline was uh, colder and, and, or, and or shallower. All right, now one of the very interesting things about El Padre, and this is, so this is this weak walker circulation, reduced uh, uh, subsurface temperature gradient, reduced surface temperature gradient, deeper thermocline is, is El Padre. That's the, that's the mean state during the Pliocene. And one of the things that, um, that uh, is 
that we've discovered over the years is that atmospheric ocean general circulation models, so climate models that are used to predict the future, cannot reproduce these, El, this, cannot really reproduce El Padre very accurately. It's very difficult to get the eastern cold, eastern uh, cold tongue to disappear. Um, it's very difficult to uh, get a more uh, symmetric temperature pattern across the Pacific um, without, a, a chain, without a big change in the absolute temperatures. Um, so uh, this um, um, points to um, uh, uh, the question as to what could be driving these things. There are something, something is maybe perhaps not represented well or, or in, 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 uh, in these global circulation models. So kind of getting back to basics, we have to think about what is it, if the thermocline is the cause of the change in temperatures, then what is it that drives thermo thermocline depth changes? Um, several studies have argued that the thermocline conditions are tied to the ocean heat budget. Now this is a map of the ocean heat budget. This is the heat flux across the air-sea interface. In this region and here, you have western boundary currents, which um, are bringing warm water poleward out of the tropics. And you have a lot of ocean heat lost to the atmosphere in these regions. These regions in here, so the, 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 the uh, heat lost in these regions is balanced by ocean heat gain in cold upwelling regions. So where you have cold water, you have a, a strong flux of, of, of heat into the ocean. Um, and the reason why you have that cold water is because the thermocline is shallow. So uh, kind of going along with that logic, um, what a deeper thermocline would mean is that the cold, and, and, and the fact that the Pliocene didn't have much of a cold tongue is that, that the tropics didn't gain as much heat then in these upwelling regions because the temperatures, because the cold tongue was, was um, much reduced. And if there's lower heat gain in upwelling regions, there must be lower heat gain in, 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 uh, in western boundary, or lower heat lost in uh, western boundary regions to balance that heat budget. And that implies that there was a, a decrease, a, a lower poleward ocean heat transport in the, in the Pliocene. So the kind of the constraint of the, of the thermocline depth and temperature gradient combined with uh, heat budget argument would, would suggest that the, there was less polar heat transport. Now this, is, this basically contradicts another main constraint on the system, which is that there was actually a reduced meridional temperature gradient in the, in the, um, in the low latitudes, in, the, in an expanded warm pool. This solid line here is its only averaged um, temperature today, and the figure and the, the gray line the gray line represents the uh, meridional temperature gradient of the Pliocene. So if you have a lower uh, uh, meridional temperature gradient, that implies that's actually that there's actually higher poleward heat transport. It's very difficult to see how that could be happening in the atmosphere because you have a reduced temperature gradient and it's hard to see how the atmosphere would be carrying that heat then. So, so that means that the higher poleward uh, heat transport had to be carried by the ocean. And so if you look at these two lines of argument, essentially they contradict each other. So there has to be um, some kind of um, solution to this, uh, this problem that still satisfies the, ob the basic observations. Now one possibility was recently proposed in a, in a paper that's in review right now. And that's um, that uh, the ocean actually didn't just gain heat in the cold upwelling regions, but in fact, in the Pliocene, if the, if the tropics gained heat over a much larger area, um, then things would be really different. And why would they do that? Well, they, you'd ha there'd have to be either less stratification or, um, and or uh, greater um, vertical mixing due to something like hurricanes in the upper ocean um, during the Pliocene. And this would lead to enhanced heat uptake then in the tropical regions and greater um, polar heat transport. Um, so this is a way of reconciling um, the, a number of constraints, the El Padre conditions, the deeper and warmer thermocline, the subsurface temperatures that we see in the Pliocene, and a reduced meridional temperature gradient. All right, so now to look at um, how this might all impact high latitudes. Um, 
I want to look a, a little bit at, uh, when you think about an El Nino and you have this change in temperature patterns in the tropics, there are these far field effects through teleconnections where you get, for instance, warming over North America. And you have cooling in other places and uh, people are, I'm sure you're familiar with a sort of a, a El Nino template of, of climate changes where you get warmer, wetter in, in, in some places and colder and drier in other places. And in a couple of studies, Molnar and Kane reviewed in the literature what the continental uh, climate was like in the Pliocene and how it was different than today and compared that to an El Nino template of climate change. And they found that there was fairly good agreement between um, what, where we think um, we see uh, uh, kind of climate or uh, anomalies during an El Nino today and, and, the, and the types of climate that we're seeing on the continents during the Pliocene. So there's a, 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 some evidence that the El Padre condition also had an influence on high latitudes, much like an El Nino does. Another uh, study, this is a modeling study of El Padre um, teleconnections. This is an atmospheric model that was forced by zonal, zonally symmetric temperatures. So this is the forcing that you can see here for this model. And what you, these are the, the temperature anomalies. And what you can see is North America, for instance, in the wintertime was quite a bit warmer um, in this, um, during um, this El Padre um, forced uh, model experiment and a little bit, um, a tiny bit warmer in, in, in the summer. Uh, so uh, uh, this su su supports the, um, the little bit of continental data that I showed you before. Um, one of the things that was really interesting about this model is that just by changing the zonal temperature gradients in the tropics, they got about a degree of global warming. Um, and that was because when you eliminate the cold upwelling areas, you eliminate the low uh, stratus clouds. Uh, that, that have high albedo. So you actually lower the albedo in certain regions of the Earth, which causes some warming. And then because the cold upwelling regions are gone, you also have warmer temperatures in some regions in the tropics that then um, lead to higher uh, water vapor content. So you have a little bit of a greenhouse effect as well. So just by changing the zonal temperature gradients, they were able to see a little bit of global warming um, only from that change alone. This is another modeling study with a coupled model by Haywood et al. Um, and here, this is one of these cases where um, when they um, forced the model with what, they, what we think are Pliocene boundary conditions, they were not able to reproduce an El Padre. The model did not give an El Padre as a solution. And so what they did is they sort of forced the model into an El Padre by eliminating the west-east temperature gradient um, uh, and then seeing what the response was. And this is the temperature anomaly due to a reduced um, uh, sea surface temperature gradient in the Pacific. And again, you see warming in North America and some warming a little bit in the summertime as well. They did not find any changes in, global, in the global temperature when they did this experiment, um, although it was warmer in North America. Um, and one thing that's interesting in this model is that they did not find any change in the uh, interannual variability. They, this model still produced El Nino uh, events. Okay, so what, what is all of this telling us? Well, one idea is that El Padre, because uh, of the teleconnections to North America, perhaps El Padre um, was uh, somewhat responsible for the inhibition of ice sheet growth in North America. And that once it broke down once the system changed to be more like the modern system and you got rid of those warm uh, upwelling areas that North America could cool and the ice sheets could grow. So there's a question as to whether or not the demise of El Padre could have impacted Northern Hemisphere glaciation um, itself. And this is a really interesting study, a modeling study that came out recently where um, Lunt et al. tried to look at different possible mechanisms for northern hemisphere glaciation. I'm only going to be talking about these two at the bottom that I've been talking about so far. And what they found was that if you model these different changes and you, get, you'll, you, you predict a certain temperature and precipitation pattern changes over Greenland and then you can run an, an offline uh, Greenland ice sheet model and see whether or not um, the changes are enough to actually um, change the Greenland ice sheet. And they found that the termination of El Padre and the temperature and precipitation pattern changes that happened as a result of that were really not enough to grow Greenland ice sheet. But the CO2 change was. And so they 
suggests that um, northern hemisphere glaciation must have been primarily driven by the change in CO2. Now, this is a model result, so, um, so uh, it's an interesting result, but um, if, we, if, we, if we look at s instead at more empirical arguments, you come to a, actually a completely different, a completely different uh, conclusion. And this, is a, this, this argument here was presented by um, Hoybers and Molnar in 2007. And Hoybers has been working on a, the, uh, a, a theory to try to explain the Pleistocene ice ages, particularly um, actually the 40,000 year um, cycles in ice ages. And the 40,000 year cycles are due to changes in the Earth's uh, uh, angle of tilt. And when you, when you change the angle of tilt, not only do you change the radiation, the intensity of solar radiation in high latitudes, but you also change the length of the summer uh, relative to the length of the winter. And so what he argues that is, is actually it's the total integrated temperature over the entire season when temperature is above zero that drives um, these 40,000 year cycles. And that's the difference between there being a glacier, uh, ice sheets um, and not ice sheets during this one obliquity cycle. And he um, calculates positive degree days, which is uh, integrated uh, temperature over all the days that are, um, where temperature is above zero. And he finds that just due to changes in the tilt of, of the Earth's axis, you get something like 100 to 200 uh, difference in positive de degree days simply by changing obliquity. And that's enough to, um, to, to drive um, uh, ice sheet growth and decay. Now, he did the same thing here for El Nino events. So if you take a bunch of El Nino years, events, and you look at the positive degree days during those El Nino years and you compare that to a normal year, this is the difference between them. And it's in the same, the colors are different, the color scales are different, but you get around the same, something like 100 to 200 uh, increase in positive de degree days during El Nino events. And so um, one conclusion from this study is that, um, that the magnitude of North American warming during an El Nino event is actually comparable to that needed to melt glacial ice sheets. And so this, this, pro, this um, pro, um, study actually comes to a different conclusion than to the one that I showed you before. So I think the jury is still out on the importance of uh, the demise of El Padre and Northern Hemisphere glaciation. Okay, finally I just want to summarize um, the lessons and future directions um, of this research. Um, probably one of the um, compelling questions is, can we expect El Padre conditions in the future? And this is a plot from the Intergovernmental um, Panel on Climate Change report in 2007 that shows global warming experiments with a bunch of different models and a tendency towards more El Nino-like mean conditions in the tropics in many of these models. So if you were just to look at the models, you would say, well, it looks like, you know, it's possible that we could be going into more of an El Padre or, you know, permanent El Nino-like state. Um, however, the mechanism um, that, uh, that uh, leads to this conclusion in these models is really different than what we see in the Pliocene. There's no mechanism. The mechanism does not include a deepening of the thermocline, which is, which is a really key um, uh, driving factor of El Padre in the Pliocene. So I think there's a lot of work to be done still to see whether or not um, what the ocean response is with global warming and how, um, and how there is, there's a possibility that there might be significant changes in, in tropical climate if these mechanisms um, prove to be important. So just to summarize the observations, um, there's been a lot of speculation at the end of this, so I just want to go back to reality about exactly what the data shows, and that's that you know, there's enhanced zonal symmetry. I think that's, that's clear in the surface and subsurface temperatures. The upwelling um, regions were warmer. I think that's a pretty solid um, observation. And there was reduced uh, low to high latitude temperature gradients um, and also reduced zonal temperature gradients in the subtropics. The lessons I think that are relevant to future climate predictions are several. Um, for one, the Pliocene climate implies that there's higher climate sensitivity, um, a doubling of CO2 on the order of four degrees or more. Um, this might be true just for um, understanding very long-term climate change, but I think that uh, it's important to uh, under uh, better understand how El Padre may have played a role in enhancing uh, global warming and um, whether or not the demise of El Padre did play a role in northern hemisphere glaciation. <laughs>
the other lesson I think we can learn that um, has a relevance to future um, climate change is that attempts to accurately model El Padre um, with uh, climate models could lead to a better understanding of a number of different things. Ocean vertical mixing, factors that influence the thermocline depth, processes that control heat transport, all things that are very important. And, um, and then um, possibly if these are incorporated or can be used to improve models to possibly um, uh, uh, help predict future climate change. Other future avenues of research that this, that, that this research can go in a lot of different directions. I think that the coastal temperature um, story is incredibly interesting, especially because it is so decoupled from the biological productivity. And if these regions are important for biogeochemical cycles in the ocean, I think they deserve a, a lot of attention and study in the future. Um, certainly, we don't understand why CO2 uh, decreased from the Pleio to the Pleistocene, from Pleistocene to Pleistocene. So that in itself is a really interesting question that needs to be answered. And finally, I'd like to know whether or not El Padre is the normal state during other warm climate periods, or if it's just this special case in the, in the Pleistocene. Um, perhaps the climate that we're looking at today has, is very different than most of um, what occurred in Earth history during the warm periods. Uh, so that's it, and uh, thanks very much for listening. And um, if there's time for questions, I'd love to answer questions. Thank you, Christina. Uh, we do have a few moments for questions before uh, the next session starts in here. But, but first, uh, we just want to make sure you have a little memento of today, <laughs> all right? Um, if people have some questions, please uh, let's see hands. Mitch. Why it started cooling? Well, at the, uh, in the East Equatorial Pacific, the first kind of dramatic dip in the thermocline, you know, when the thermocline gets colder, that's been attributed to the closing of the Panama Seaway, and I think that might be true. That might be, that might be it. But, but the temperature decreases throughout the Pleistocene, and the thermocline subsurface depth or the subsurface temperatures also decrease um, kind of monotonically through the Pleio Pleistocene. So I still think CO2 might be the, the best answer um, to, that, to that question. Well, I mean, one of the things about, that's interesting to me about studying the Pliocene is that all you want to do is actually look at what happened before, and that's what we're starting to do, because I, we've thought about that. Um, so I think that's definitely a possibility. I mean, there could be two solutions to the same CO2 level, depending on where you're coming from. Um, I, so that I totally agree with. I think that there's still a problem. And, right, I mean, if, if you can't get the, the uh, climate model to somehow uh, get rid of that asymmetry across the Pacific. I mean, this is a big change. It seems like the model should be able to do that. You should be able to get those, the cold tongue to be warmer 
Um, so, so that doesn't really speak to the climate sensitivity issue that you just brought up. But I think it's a, it is a legitimate thing to try to do with a climate model to just see if you can reproduce a very dramatic and, and robust um, observation from, from the Pliocene. Yeah, both in the tropical East Equatorial Pacific and in the coastal upwelling regions, you know, you have this, this cooling that goes on. But the biological productivity is doing all kinds of, I mean, there are diatom mats in the East Equatorial Pacific in the late Miocene and early Pliocene. Very high productivity in this region when we have warm temperatures. If you look at productivity um, estimates of different types from the coastal upwelling regions, the same thing. There's periods of high productivity, periods of low. They're not necessarily correlated to the temperature changes. So it has to do with um, something about nutrient cycling, a decoupling of um, nutrients and temperature. Today, we think of them as so tightly coupled, the thermocline and the neutrocline perhaps is tightly coupled, that there must have been some decoupling that happened. Um, through that. Uh, there's uh, um, some nitrogen isotope data um, that shows that uh, a big change, a big tr a change in nitrogen isotopes as well, um, indicating that the degree of denitrification in the ocean may have changed. So there's, there's a lot of uh, poss possible things that haven't been really studied very well that, that, could, be, that could be really interesting. Okay. Thank you all for coming and thank you, Christina. Thanks.